Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on this show. You know, we're not doing metal today. We're going to dump in, jump into the prog world with the one and only Mr. Mark Kelly, keyboardist of Marillion, a band that I've probably been following since their first album. What's going on, Mark? Really? Since the first album? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm 51 years old. Okay, so yeah. Well, you must have started young, that's all I can say. So um, yeah, because we it's the 40 year anniversary this year. For, well, Steve Rothery has been in the band 40 years and I'm 38, 39 years nearly. <laughs> so yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time, yeah. Um, exciting news, uh, Marillion's new album, Friends from the Orchestra, uh, going to be released on November 29th, I believe. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me. I know you guys are on tour right now. Go ahead. I think you've got a better idea than me of the release date because, uh, yeah, we're on tour and I haven't really been following it, to be honest, when it's been released. But, um, yeah, it's all it's all finished and, and we're actually on tour with touring the album. The album was sort of conceived as a an accompaniment to the tour, really. Um, mm -hmm. We figured it would be nice to... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a couple of years. In 2017, we played a, a show at the Royal Albert Hall in London, which is a beautiful venue, well known for classical music, really, you know. And um, we had the idea of having a, not really an orchestra, because it's only a six piece, um, four string players, French horn, and a flautist um, um, join us on stage. And it went down so well that we said, well, let's try and do this again, because it was just a one off, you know. Um, and then we said, okay, maybe we could do a tour. And then we said, it would be nice to give people a, an idea of what we're going to be doing. So then we said, well, why don't we quickly record an album of some songs with them? Um, and about a year ago, we went off to real world studios, Peter Gabriel's place where we've been there a few times before, um, uh, nice environment to work. And, um, we, we were just going to knock out a bunch of songs, but then it's, you know, as, as it always happens with Marillion, it turned into like a three or four month project and, um, and we ended up making a, a it's almost an 80 minute album actually, um, with a selection of songs from, from our whole career, really. Um, the ones that we thought would work best with these extra players. And so then, so here we are on the tour. So yeah, here we are in tonight. We're playing in Glasgow in Scotland and, um, yeah, we're working our way around the UK. So, Mark, you're the keyboardist in Marillion. So you have this quartet and you have keyboards which sound very similar, right, in the mix. Where does the keyboards fit when you already have some sort of orchestra or a string quartet? Okay, so, yeah, it's a good question because I, I just assumed that I would have to sort of drop some parts and let the string players take over. And, you know, with the flute as well and French horn, it's, it's usually... That's the stuff that the keyboard player does, you're right. So, um, but I had a conversation with Mike Hunter, who's our producer, engineer, and also um, did, did wrote the string arrangement, the, the parts for these players. And, you know, I said, so Mike, what should I do on this song? What do you think? And he said, just do what you normally do because I'm gonna make these arrangements fit in with what you do. So they're not gonna be doing the same thing as you. So, and it works really well because we don't have a, it's not like we've got a huge string section. So what they do is they complement what I'm playing. And if you, you know, if you just had four string players on their own, it would sound a bit thin to be honest. So they, they add to what I'm doing. You know, I, I, I'm adding the sort of the, the, the body, if you like, the, the warmth and, and they're adding the, the detail, you know, the, the stuff that makes it sound human, you know, so it works really really well actually and it's quite common people do it a lot where they rather than having a whole orchestra when they're recording they might just they will have some what well, you know fake strings effectively but with some real players on top to make it and it just gives you the, the effect that the whole thing sounds real then you know so because you get that you know the, the human touch in there um that you, it's not easy to achieve with, with keyboards it's it's um it's a different thing you know um so it works really well Take a song like The Hollow Man, right? You have your strings, and then you have the piano, which is basically, that that kind of fits together. That's, that's Steve Hogarth plays the piano on that one. But, but, but 
That, that one actually, you're right, because it was very, it was a very um, stripped back song originally. There wasn't much on it. There was room. There was room to add the extra players and and you know the space for the orchestral players to to work with. And I think that one works really well actually. Um, it wasn't one of my favourites on Brave, but the way it's done now on this tour with 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 the additional players, I think it really brings it to life and and gives it a lot more emotion and and yeah, I think it's a you know one of the highlights of the show actually. But um, but no, to give you an example, um, maybe a song like. Um, let me think. Estonia, um, we do that, and and there's there's a lot of extra stuff that they're playing on that, um, which which complements what, what the rest of us are doing, you know. So, um, and then you've got songs like we didn't record the Great Escape, but we have been playing it because originally when we did that one, we actually had some some players from the from the Liverpool Philharmonic on on the album. So of course the parts were already there. So, you know, we didn't really have to change anything. And, and of course it works because there's a, there's a flute, there's a French horn, there's strings. So, um, yeah. So they call it a re-imaging, or I guess we would call it re-recording. What was the criteria to choose those songs from your, your vast catalog? Like, what was the criteria for this album? We, we, we looked through the entire catalog and then we selected songs that we thought we could do justice to that we, that would be worth doing again with with the extra players we ended up with probably over an hour's worth of well yeah there was over an hour's worth of material because i think the cd clocks in at about nearly 80 minutes so um yeah. we did leave a few out you know a few sort of fell by the wayside as we were going because we decided that they weren't working as well um but the ones that we ended up with were the ones you know that, that seemed to work best and sometimes you can't tell you know the until you try it, you know, um, there's a few that we thought would definitely work and, you know, right from the off. But, um, you know, and when we're playing live, we play more than the stuff that's on the on the CD. We we had a, a bunch of songs that we played um, with on the last Royal Albert Hall show back in 2017, like The Space, for example, which, which really works with the strings because it's got a, a, the, the parts. Um, and you know that's that's pretty much it. I mean, it's 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 just down to what we think works best, and and there's some nice you know additional parts been added. Um, there's a, we did we do yeah Gars is one that we're playing on the tour, but we but we didn't re-record. Uh, for example, um, I think um, that works really well. But but you you have to come to the shows to hear that. When you were re-recording the songs, did you change any lyrics? Did you change any musical parts? Were there any changes from the original songs yeah, on this strange engine? That that was, um, I think, when we when we recorded it. It's hard to remember, but um, there was we felt that the, it was just a bit too long that section. The, the, if, if that's what you're talking about, it's it, the uh, the uh, ooh, I can't try to remember the lyric now. Uh, anyway, Steve cut a couple of lines, or you know, the line. yeah, and and of course, the, funnily enough. By cutting those lines, the last line did, that doesn't rhyme anymore, but but that's how it ended up on the album. And now he's he said, why don't I put that back in? Because you know it, he'd written it, and it's you know funnily enough we played it a couple of nights ago, and of course all the string players, the orchestra players, are all reading music off off you know sheets, and we're all playing from memory. And um, Steve forgot to put the line back in um, that he did. He'd added in because he was so used to playing it without it. And I goes, like, you know, we all heard him sing the final line and we all stopped and they all carried, the string players all carried on because they were reading it. And, and we just took the cue from Steve who got it wrong. So it was, it was, it was funny, but, um, you know, it was fine. Um, but yeah, mostly the arrangements are the, are the same. Um, it's not like we, in 2009, we did a, um, an album called Less Is More, which was like acoustic versions. And we, we pretty much changed the arrangements completely. Those songs um, were even more reimagined than this, you know. Um, so, but this time we decided we're going to stick to this, you know, the arrangements pretty much how they were. There are some, some minor changes, but um, that wasn't the point of it really. We didn't want to make, you know, rewrite the songs. We just wanted to, to do, like I said, it's supposed to accompany the tour and, and for people to, to have it as a, it's almost like, you know, you go to see a show and you, you buy a souvenir from the show. Okay, it's it's on sale apart from 
at the shows, but that's the idea of it, really. And it's not it's not really meant to be. It's not like the next studio, uh, studio album, you know. Um, it's like the, I suppose you could have buying a live album from a tour, although it's not live. Marillion has always been a band that sort of takes a risk and jumps off into another direction. Would you ever consider re-recording the Fish era music? Of course, with Steve on vocals. You know, maybe changing it up. Maybe add a string quartet. I don't know. Just taking the songs of old and and playing around with them today. To- yeah, it's it's possible. You know, these things are all possible to do. I think there would be some resistance to that from people that you know love the old fish songs, love love the way fish sang them. And I think it's you know playing playing those songs live is one thing, but but doing them, re-recording them effectively, would I think some people might object to that, and understandably. I mean, we're, we're going through the process at the moment of, of um, remixing all the old albums and doing 5.1 mixes, and that's been quite interesting and fun. Um, I think, you know, it's like we've just literally finished doing script for Jester's Tear, and, um, and I think the remixes make, really make it sound nice. Um, it's, it's, it's a real improvement. I mean, you know, the technology's moved on from the early 80s. And what's what makes it, I think, a real collectible album is the fact that there's a documentary that's going with it. It's about 90 minutes long, which tells the story, the story of the very early days of the band from the people that were there, including some ex-members, actually. So, um, so that's, I haven't watched it yet. It's, been, it's literally being edited at the moment, but the, the, the guy that's doing it, um, has said that you know it's, it's turned into a real labor of love. He says it really tells the story well. There's a lot of great information there that people won't know. Um, so um, I think that would be one that people will, will like to see. So, when are you planning to release the uh, I guess the expanded edition of a Script for Adjuster's Tear? It's going to be probably January, I think. Are there any unreleased material from that era, from that script era? From that time, we we actually um. When we were recording the album, we played three shows at the Marquee Club, which was because we did it in the, the, the Marquee Studio, which was sort of attached to the club. It was at the back of the club. Uh, and there were tie lines leading from the studio to the stage. So while we were recording, we took the opportunity to play play there as well, because we were used to, we, it was the place that we always played in London. Uh, so we did three nights in a row over Christmas and recorded two of them. Now, one of them has actually been mixed and released as part of a box set maybe 10, 10 or so years ago. But there's one night, which was the the, the second night of the, those three nights. Uh, it's never been heard before. Um, and Andy Bradfield, who's mixed it, has done a great job. It sounds really good. I think it's a huge improvement on the one that was released previously. But these this night has never been released. These songs, none of them have ever been heard like, you know, um, uh, before. So, so that's quite nice because that's from 1982. So... Very early. So, which expanded editions have you done, and which new ones will you be doing? We've we've done so far: Misplaced Childhood, Brave, Afraid of Sunlight, Clutching at Straws, and then it's Script, and then we've got how many more? This is all the old EMI catalog, basically. So, there's Fugazi, Seasons End, and Holidays Need to Go, and then that'll be all eight albums done. Um, I don't know if we'll do any of the others. I mean. I'd, it's they've been very well received and um i actually don't have a 5.1 system at home and i I'm, I'm, it's one of those things that it's hard to judge whether it's as popular as people people i think people thought it would become more popular than it actually is 5.1 you know what i mean it's a bit of a niche thing isn't it here's another question for you you know i'm, I'm you know i'm we're talking i'm in canada here are you a rush fan yeah yeah well i like rush i mean i don't listen to i I haven't, I haven't listened to their more recent stuff. Out of the, okay, you can tell me which which Rush album from their the last ten years of their career should I buy? I think you got to listen to A Clockwork Angels. That was the last Rush album, and even Geddy Lee has said in interviews that that is his favorite album. So go with A Clockwork Angels, their last album. Yeah, I know people have said that. Yeah, that it's a real you know. I remember seeing Marillion open up for Rush. I think it was, I think it was, yeah, I think it was Power Windows. You guys did all of Misplaced Childhood from like start to finish. Yes, we did because it was like 1986, I think, um, summer of 86. Yeah. 
Well, you know, yeah, we we had a that was a really really good tour. It's a shame we didn't manage to do the whole thing because because it was really enjoyable and and Rush was so nice to us. They were they were real gentlemen, and um, it was funny because I'm sure I've told this story. You might I, I, you know stop me if you've heard it. But it's, uh, we we first opened for Rush at Radio City Music Hall in in the previous year in eighty actually eighty four. No, no. Yes, it was 84. And, um, and we, we died. The, the audience hated us, you know. And, um, yeah, it was, it was all five nights we did with them, opening five nights in a row, and every night was terrible. Um, the, you know, we had people, sh- you know, heckling us. And <laughs> Anyway, uh, about a year later, we get a phone call from our agent saying, oh, Rush want you to open for them on a tour. And we're like, really? Really? After that? After, after that Radio City disaster, uh, and they said, "Yeah, they really liked you." So we're like, "Okay, we'll do it." But we're going to play Misplaced Childhood, the entire album from start to finish, so that people can't boo us in between songs. And that was the reason why we did that. But but we didn't need to worry because once we were outside of New York, it was actually really good. And in fact, in Canada, I uh, mean, we, we we picked up a an entire audience. It was like. We went from zero to being able to play to thousands of people because of those dates that we did with Rush. An offbeat question for you. And it's related to when you guys started off. Uh, Marillion, I remember when you guys started off, you had that Genesis vibe. And everybody was comparing you guys to Genesis. And they go, oh, here's the new Genesis. And then when we look at like a band like Greta Van Fleet today, you know, they're, they sound like Led Zeppelin. Everybody's giving them heck for being Led Zeppelin. And what do you say to the people, the naysayers of the Greta Van Fleets, who are, you know, a young bunch of guys, like you were a bunch of young bunch of guys starting off, who have this vibe of Led Zeppelin. What do you say to those naysayers? Because you guys were kind of in that position too. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think all bands, when they start off, everybody, you know, is influenced and, and borrows more or less from other people, some more heavily than others. I mean, we, we... We, we did have a, a, a bit of a Genesis sound. It wasn't intentional. This is the really funny thing. So I actually wasn't even a Genesis fan when I joined Marillion. Um, so it, it was sort of, um, you know, it's one of those things you just end up getting compared to other people. And especially when you're, when you're starting out, nobody knows what you sound like. It's natural. Somebody say, oh, yeah, they sound a bit like Genesis or they sound a bit like Led Zeppelin or whatever. And I think um, and probably in, in a lot of cases it might be true. But, but over time hopefully you develop your own sound and you you know you you go your own way and and um you know as you know we don't sound anything like genesis these days i'm not sure it's just a few moments really in our in our music that sounded a lot like genesis but then you know there were there were other bands around at the time that that um had had the same same issue you know, and then there were other bands like there was a Canadian band, Starcastle. They sounded like yes, everybody said. You know, um, there's quite a few you know instances. And I think Led Zeppelin used to get accused of sounding like um, some some blues band. Yeah, but then yeah, there you go. <laughs> what about what about your thoughts of okay? You do these conventions again. You guys are groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. What about having a Marillion? convention you know with mick pointer and fish and marillion just everybody sort of in a marillion family for one night like a marillion fest well like most families we've got you know we don't all get on that well yeah. you know so <laughs> oh yeah i don't I, i'm not sure it's what people would want really that's that that would be a tricky one i mean we over the years we had um you know various talks with fish about doing the tour together and uh, there was one point where he asked, we asked him and he said no, and then he asked us and we said no. Um, yeah. You know, just, just because, not because we thought it was a terrible idea or he thought it was a terrible idea. It's just that the time wasn't right. And now I think the time's passed, you know. It's, it's, um, it's, whilst we get on okay and we do see each other from time to time, I think it's probably not likely to happen at, at any point in the future. Okay. So, Fair yeah. enough. Oh, and, and I just want you to tell everybody who doesn't know this. And I mean, there are fans out there who don't know this. You guys were one of the first GoFundMe bands. I mean, you're, you're, you're I guess, I think it was on Marillion.com when you first started this. Maybe it was a little bit before. I can't remember. It was actually, um, okay, so this, the quick version of the story is that you, you're, you're at the right sort of time. It was like 90, around about 97, 
um, which was this strange engine, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, we were asked, I was asked actually, if we were going to do a tour in the States, that was how it started. And, and I explained that we, we didn't have a deal. And every time we went to the States, we always lost money, you know, including when we opened for Rush. I mean, it was, it's expensive. And we, you know, we, I think you get used to touring at a certain level and then you want to take everything with you. So when, when we were going to the States, we were playing clubs, but we were, we were hauling around a semi full of gear, you know, um, which was crazy. I mean, <laughs> so we knew how to waste money, but it meant that the tours lost money. And so I explained on this mailing list back then that we, we wouldn't be able to do it because we, we didn't have any record company support and they usually would make up the shortfall. So the, the, this fan said, well, why don't we raise the money? We could, we could all just like start a, you know, like a, open a bank account and everybody could put some money in. And then when we raise the money, we give it to you and you do the tour. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thinking, well, this is this guy's crazy, you know. Um, and then he's like, "How much would you need?" And I, I was thinking, I, I, I was trying to put him off, you know, like, yeah, probably about sixty thousand dollars. And then a few weeks later, I get a message saying, "Well, we've got eighteen thousand so far." <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh, "Jesus, I better tell the rest of the band." So, uh, so I tell the band we might be doing a tour in the summer because there's these fans that are raising this money, and if they can, I told them if they could get to sixty thousand dollars, we it would. It would be possible for us to do it. Anyway, long story short, we did the tour. It was a, it was a really nice tour, and it was quite successful because of all the publicity that we got around the story. You know, everybody ran the story about the, these fans that raised the money, and and um, so it was a sort of forerunner to crowdfunding, although we didn't know it at the time because nobody was doing anything like that. And then a few years later, so we did radiation, and then. Um, uh, Marillion.com was the last record we were we were due to to do on this label we were with at the time, uh, and I said, why don't we call it Marillion.com because we wanted because it was in the early days of the internet and we were, and I was trying to get get it across that we've got a website. I know it sounds completely lame and 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 so obvious now, but at the time, you know, it wasn't and, and you know there, there was still you know you still had a people that didn't even know what the internet was, you know, and, and using Netscape web browser. Do you remember that? Yep. <laughs> yep. And um, so it was, it, it, it was the early days. We had a few thousand people on our mailing list. And, and, um, and I said, well, we could basically call the album com. We can put a, a card in the album to try and get people's details. And so we were sort of planning ahead to the point where we were going to leave the label and you know, we knew that we had to try and build up a database, as they call it. Um, and then we 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 did the um, we sent out a question to to the fans. It was about six thousand of them that we had by then, whose names and addresses and you know email addresses. Um, you know, would they consider buying an album in advance before we make it to help fund it? That was the question. And then we had a huge response. Um, Practically everybody said yes. A few hundred people said they wouldn't. And then we figured that was enough. If people did what they said they would do, it would be enough to, to fund the album. So we decided not to sign. We had two or three deals on, on, you know, on the table, on offer, for what we, you know, that we could sign. But we decided not to sign a record deal and go this new, exciting, dangerous and, um, you know, uh, route. And... Um, so we made Anarachnophobia, and that was the first album we did in that sort of crowdfunding model. And of course, from then on, it it it, it grew and grew, and it became um, it worked really well for us because we we ended up being becoming self sufficient financially from album to album, rather than having to make an album a year, which is what we did. You know, ninety seven was um, the Strange Engine, ninety eight was Radiation, ninety nine was Dot Com. You know. Um, and, and it was get, whilst I don't think those albums are bad, it's quite a, you know, it's quite a lot of, um, it's hard to be creative, make an album, record it, tour it, make an album, record it, tour it and keep doing that. It did feel like a bit of a treadmill, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so it meant that we could have spend a bit more time, um, writing, uh, uh, I mean, these days it's got a bit ridiculous because now we're like into three, four, five years between albums and people are starting to complain, but um, we are working on another one, um, but the touring is, is, you know, is going well as well. So, it's, so, so it's the last, of, yeah, yeah, great. And so the last question uh, for the day, uh, new album 
<laughs> I guess everyone's asking, right? So I might as well ask. Are you, are you working on the material? And what we kind are. of time frame are you looking at? We are working on the material. We decided, because we keep doing all these things like tours and, you know, the Strings album and stuff, we decided that we would set aside next year to make the album. We, we're doing one thing next year, apart from writing and recording, which is Cruise City Edge in March. Um, and that's it. And the rest of the year is going to be devoted to getting the next album written and recorded. So we've done some work on it, but we're nowhere near ready. So it's going to take probably to the end of the year and we'll, we'll have it early 21. That's the, that's the plan. Perfect. There we go. My guest, Mark Kelly, keyboardist of Marillion, uh, the new album with friends from the orchestra. And we're saying November 29th is the release date on ear music, at least here in North America. Uh, with friends from the orchestra, it's basically re-imaging or re-recording of their old their catalog songs like Estonia, a collection, uh, this strange engine, the Hollow Man, and many many more in Seasons End, which is great, and Ocean Cloud, which is remarkable. Eighty minutes of music, go pick it up, a must for all music fans. Thank you so much, Mark. It, yeah, thank you. Good to talk. Get ready for the ride with your-